Hello, everybody, and welcome to This Week in X, presented by Crushing Comics. I'm your host, Crisis with a K. I'm here surrounded by my favorite X friends and X fans from around the world. It's funny when I say that because it sounds like they're my former friends and former fans, but I mean X-Men fans uh, from around the world. X, Tyler, Harry, and Faria. And we are here to talk about Marauders number 20 out on the 5th of May, 2021. And this comes with the warning that every episode comes with, which is it's a spoilers discussion. We're going to talk about not only every plot point in this book, but all of the plot that connects to these plots as far back as the beginning of the Marvel Universe, and you've been warned. For Marauders number 20, as we always do, we're going to start with our initial reactions before digging in more deeply, and we're going to start with Tyler. I, I think this is a fun send-off issue. Um, a lot of it has to do with a little bit of nostalgia for me. Um, there is great art. There is The coloring is quite good. Um, you know, I mean, I, I like it. I, I've not liked, I mean, it, and even even though it mentioned the Verandi once, at least we don't have to look at those kids anymore. So I give it a, you know, 3.5 knives out of five. <laughs> Harry. I really like this. Uh, I am such a mark for this kind of issue, which is just kind of the calm before the storm, or in this case, in an actual storm. But it's very just a lot of reminiscing and a lot of great art and a lot of just talking about how great Storm is. And like, I'm not made of stone. That's a great pitch for a comic. Like it was really fun. And, you know, we've been reading this book for a while and we've had our ups and downs of it, but like we get to this point and it does feel a little earned that they're having like a send off to one of the bigger characters on the book. I just, mm -hmm. I felt like quietly satisfied at the end. Like this was a nice marker of the series and uh, yeah, I'd give it a, a happy, four uh, knives out of five, which is not as many as other people have in this book. Uriha. So when I'm, whenever I'm trade, trade reading or like reading like a long-term stories, I, uh, I absolutely love these kind of issues. Like absolutely love that when the characters get to sit to sit down and they're talking about whatever. And then there is usually a party. Um, so because of that, this was obviously like written for me. Um, and then there's like all these different, you know, um, stuff that is thrown in. Then I'm like, now I'm like, I know all of this now. <laughs> I know all of this now. So that was like a very, um, like, you know, that really got me. Uh, but the one that was like, you know, got it to five, five out of five because um, what's, his, what's his name? Um, oh my God. What? Lock, what's it? No, Lockheed? no, the lo Lockheed, like lo Lockheed? Lo the Lockheed, dragon? Like, the purple dragon? The dragon. Yeah, the purple dragon, like, you know, Lockheed, Lockheed, Lockheed right? Lockheed. Yeah, Lockheed was, he was the captain. And then he was going like <laughs> this. Good. And then Emma's like, <laughs> hey. And then the thing is, thing is, my cat makes the exact same face when I do this, like, chin scratches. She loves chin scratches. And I'm like, I'm out of my <laughs> You know, I appreciated this on one level and didn't on another level. It kind of felt like, you know, this this group, this family, this team around the dinner table sharing time with each other. I don't know that any of the 19 prior issues plus the King and Black issue ever showed us this team being a team enough that I actually bought this. I think that um, if this had spent less time lingering on this Madripoor nonsense, which has taken up way too many issues, and more time just seeing them be the Marauders doing the kinds of things they were doing in this issue, it would have hit for me. But because I don't believe in this team and I don't think that Dugan got there, it kind of fell flat for me because I, I just was like, you, you never gave us this. So why should I have any sentiments about this? Storm barely even felt like a character in this book for most of the run. She felt like she was just there to react to Kitty dying to me. And we all knew Kitty didn't die, so Storm didn't really matter. Uh, <laughs> so I, but I did love the opening and the closing. I loved Emma here. I think mm -hmm. Emma's fish out of water quality on this team and in this group, and, and then the way she very easily translates between different social circles at the end there is the most fascinating thing. And that's the thing I really love about this book. And it just felt like the thing that we were getting in this issue was maybe what this book promised it would be and what I thought it would be early on, but it never actually really was. So it kind of made me more angry than nostalgic, which is maybe coming through in my comment. Uh, but before this story even really begins, we get a data page, which is quite an interesting data page because it explains the 
origin of one of the costume elements that Kate Pride will be wearing to the Hellfire Gala. We know this because we covered all the looks and she was one of the first looks that was previewed, but it's a diamond brooch with a bullet on it, which of course has a significance that we have all read about in Astonishing X-Men. So Faria, what did you think about Emma gifting Kate this very symbolic brooch, symbolic ornament to wear in her big gala debut? So Kate, um... Emma was the first person that ha- who wanted to get Kate into the mutant dome, right? Mm-hmm. Like she was the one who went to her house first and then Professor X came and then all that thing happened. So I think she was already very much fascinated, not necessarily fascinated, but you know, just like, oh, okay, this is one character like that I need to get in under my wings. But I think when the whole bullet thing happened, like for the first time ever, Emma decided to respect someone. Like it wasn't just like, you know, it, she, she usually doesn't do that. You know, there's like, she has like, you know, she, everything is a transactional for her, but this is Kate became that one person that she just, her respect for her just like went like, you know, in a, in a level. And then we also saw that like when she came back, then she was like, kind of took her on like, you know, I need you to help me deal with, um, what's his name Shaw and then did it again so it's like you know it just all came from that so I think that's one of the reasons is like you know she wanted to do something nice for her friend and you know did that and then I just love the whole thing it's like uh P.S. if you decide to give this give the bridge to an archin please don't tell me (laughs) I thought that was like a perfect line to kind of end the like you know her character and everything um but yeah that it just I think it comes from a place of respect and you know I think she just can't get over the whole bullet thing Mm. Harry I I liked it I think it's just a nicely designed thing it's just a nice bit of shading as we get into this big party and it just shows there's a lot of thought and characters put behind a lot of the different accessories um and I like the bullet thing that's one of the first X-Men comics I ever read so like it just has a nice spot in my heart and I like just the warm level, the warm, just continuing kind of respect that these two characters have for each other. It's one of those things I like the most in this book. Time. And it tracks because Emma did not try to get Kitty at a time into her school, like not just once. I think oh, no. she tried many, <laughs> many, many, many At least times. four times. At least. Yeah. Better at. So, you know, I mean, you have not reached there yet very high in the reread. Um, mm-hmm. But, you know, you're going to get that. They, these two characters have a lot of history in that sense. Right. And um, before I get to the the thing that I that really struck me with this opening data page, um, just a small minor touch thing is that Emma has been using Proteus a lot. Why? Mm, trying to get on his good side, trying to make him mm. trust her. Trying, trying to, to tell, line them up for a big revelation that might be upcoming. Maybe, you know, you know. T- hey, tell me what mommy's up to. <laughs> tell Auntie Emma what mommy's up to. I just, I just saw, like, you know. So like, has the yeah, family. Thought about that. <laughs> yeah, how's the yeah. family? What's going on? Have, have killed Dustin lately? <laughs> <laughs> I mean, um, the, the truth Emma is. Wants the, to know. The, 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 <laughs> I mean, besides that, I mean, the truth is. I mean, it's two different layers. The first layer is that I I absolutely love how much um, thought that um, each writers and each artist put into the whole gala thing, even if it's just a one night thing, even if they are just drawing that character for once, I think they put quite a bit of thoughts into it. And I I don't actually remember something lined white that so many people put so much effort and thought behind it. And it just, it just makes me as an X fan, as a long term X fan, really, really excited and really, really, mm-hmm. you know, overjoyed in a sense. And then this is a super nice callback to the end of Astonishing X Men, in particular the issue Dust, which is one of the few comic books that actually made me cry. So, mm-hmm. so this kind it's of true. like, especially the last monologue by Kitty right mm-hmm. after she had sex with Peter for the first time. That's why Tyler and... cried. <laughs> <laughs> they yeah, consummated. That's why. <laughs> well, if you have to know, another comics that made me cry is I Kill Giant. 
Oh, oh for yeah. sure. Oh, oh well, yeah. Obviously. Yeah. Mm, 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 <laughs> of course. I made my, uh, my sister was fighting with my mom. I made her read I Kill a Giant. And, so, and then she became very chubby with my mom again. <laughs> oh, that was so, so good. Uh, but yes, okay. I agree to all of this. That's a Tyler. Sorry. I couldn't no, help I'm, myself. I'm done. I'm, I'm kind of done after okay. you guys talk about Peter. But anyway. <laughs> One thing I would say, though, like, you know, you said that as an X-Men, a long-term X-Fan, X-Fan, that you were so excited about it. I'm like, as a short-term X-Enthusiast and also, but as someone who loves looking at good-looking people, I'm super excited about this gala. Yeah. <laughs> so bring it on! I'm that. all over for the party. <laughs> and there better be, like, huge reveal where there's, like, Indian Bollywood-style dun 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 face of everyone. I want, I'm living for that. Do you know how, how long it has been since I've been to one of my family's wedding? It has been a I, long time, so I need my drama. I am so excited for these issues. <laughs> Good you Lord. know, I, I think the three of you covered why this data page, it's its really one of the best pages in the book, except for the last two pages, which we'll get to. Um, mm-hmm. But the thing that really hit me to expand a little bit, I think on Freya's point is, Emma was so impressed and respects Kitty so much for that sacrifice. But Emma knows tragedy and sacrifice because I always come back to one of my first comics, maybe my like sixth or seventh comic that I ever read, uh, Uncanny X-Men 281, where Emma has to watch this class of... Oh, of Oh, yes. Free close your ears, because I'm going to spoil you super, yeah. super hard for Emma. Super, stuff super here. hard. Um, Emma has to watch her whole first class of kids be killed, which is a, an experience we know that now Xavier and Mora have had as well. It's almost a rite of passage for these teachers. Mm-hmm. And Emma herself would have done anything. And she ultimately does sacrifice herself. And only but for the grace of Jean Grey does she wind up li- living, which kind of mm-hmm. introduces a whole new dynamic. And so I think... Kitty and the bullet always makes me think of Uncanny X-Men 281 because Kitty was supposed to be her original student. And here's Ki- Kitty sacrificing herself, a thing that Emma has done, and, and Emma can't stop either part of it. And in that moment, she respects Kitty so much, as Freya said, not only because she respects her choice, but she's like, you're, you're doing the sacrifice and you're doing the save the world and you're my student and I'm losing you. And I have to like have all of that as once like kind of almost the teacher has become the student like I'm seeing this person that I've traumatized that I've tried to recruit make this choice and I think that I always view any Kitty Emma scene through that whole complicated series of events right Uncanny X-Men you know 129 then all the subsequent times she tries to recruit Kitty and then 281 and then the bullet and then and then so that's I think why a page like this like hits for me so so much and and for all the reasons you've all said too uh clearly it's one of the best relationships in all of X-Men and and it's fun to mine and I think Dugan does a a really good job with it so now we're all around the table with Storm reminiscing about our favorite Storm story Everybody gets a shot, although not everybody takes their shot. Callisto passes. So what I want to do is I want to do a lightning round round. You can pick any one of the stories that you want to make your comment about. If we need to go around again, we will. Uh, But which one do you think deserves the most discussion? And we will certainly share that discussion with you if there are things about it to share. Starting with Faria, which one would you want to highlight of Pyro, Bishop, Iceman, Callisto not telling a story, Emma, and Kate? The Emma one really made me like, you know, happy because (laughs) I'm like, oh yeah, I remember that. (laughs) You know, I remember (laughs) when that happened uh, because that was their first appearance, like her first appearance. And then, you know, she, she took, she kidnapped Storm and then Storm was like, ah, nah. And then beat the living daylight out of her. I'm assuming that's where it came from. I don't know whether they, they did that beating up later, even if they did, that's all Kate remembers of Storm that all the time she beat me up <laughs> and now no, she's you know Emma now she... remembers of Storm that's what I'm saying sorry that's yeah. you that said Kate it... just now. oh sorry sorry, sorry. Emma uh, remembers of Storm it's like that all the time she beat me up so I thought that that was very um you know that was very interesting and I think for coming from Emma that makes it interesting because you know she's not a very much of a physical person but then also like you know there's this all this time when she became the storm became a royalty and she always wants to become a queen so and there Mm -hmm. was this whole thing about like yeah your highness you know when she was in the school and after all that so i think like there was like that comes into play with like yeah but you know she's graceful it's okay so if i get beaten up by her 
Well, Ta- this, were you able this, to place it chronologically, Tyler? Because I have some, I have thoughts. I tried, but it's not exact fit. So the the thing that clue me on to this is that this is Storm in her classic first appearance costume. Mm-hmm. And before she became the Mohawk Storm. And during that period, she only met, I think, White Queen twice. So once is... Um, like Fariha mentioned earlier in the Dark Phoenix saga, mm-hmm. um, where um, in the, during the first appearance of uh, Emma. And mm-hmm. the second time was, spoilers, <laughs> is Uncanny X-Men 151 and 152, yeah. where they do a body swap. Mm. And I actually thought Ooh. this was the body swap uh, episode, uh, talking about the body swap thing. Um, but when I went back to... 152 and look at how it ended this exact scene did not happen yeah there's really Uh, no space for it no so i actually took it as the emma remembering it yes (laughs) so this did not as actually happen but emma just like oh no I, i i remembered it this way yeah, no, I mean, because I actually went back and I read uh, 129, um, mm-hmm. like, you know, again, just to kind of see. And then I, I genuinely like, you know, the way the the way like uh, Storm's faces were, it's someone who's getting beaten up, remembering the beater mm-hmm. that way. It's like, oh, yeah, like she was scary, you know, mm-hmm. that's why I didn't win. OK, <laughs> like, <laughs> like it just felt like that a lot more. So, Harry, which <laughs> one? You've, Emma has already been taken by yeah. Korea. What story would you like to highlight? Uh, you know, I really like the first one where he rescues the uh, mutant girl in India because, mm. or she rescues the mutant girl in India because, you know, it's it's there's a lot of shades to this character, but I'm just I am a mark for like superheroes just making situations better, and like she showed up and saved like a child from like a life of servitude, just beating up ships, and like it just was a really nice way to lead this off it just felt right and it's like it's just one of those things i really like about the x-men they kind of show up and help these children and students and what have you and i also just really like the line where they the shipmaster what have you just goes she does the work of a dozen men and then storm's like yeah most of us do that's just a really good line like it, it landed really well and uh yeah it just it's just like a really strong start to this little walk down memory lane hmm. i mean anyone else have thoughts on that one dugan being a little bit more um, well, I mean, I just I recently started following Dugan on social media, and oh. he certainly lean very liberal. Yeah, yeah so his his opinions here, are very obvious. Yeah. <laughs> so here he he made some commentary about how the richer nations dump their stuff into the poorer nations of the world, and mm. you know he he did not he did not you know dwell on it, but it is apparent like what his thoughts on on those things are, and um. I, I mean, I just, in, in this scene, I just sort of like really love how um, badass Storm is. She's like, she just catched the whip like with a bare yeah. hand and it's like nothing, you know? And, and Bishop mentioned it, which is, which, which I love because when Bishop first appears in Uncanny X-Men, he worship Storm. He's like, I, get it. I remember that the, I mean, I did not remember the exact words, but I pulled out that panel and it says, Storm, every bit as commanding, every bit as beautiful as the legend says. <laughs> so oh, no. that's, that's, that's Bishop's opinion down. of Storm. And even I think at this point, Bishop still have that respect for her. Um, the only- the, w- one thing that kind of stood out to me for that particular scene is like there's all so many mutants that are currently still out there who are not in Krakoa. Oh no, are, you're going yeah. there again. No, no, I've already <laughs> used that up. I've only allowed myself one time in a week. But it gets uh, yeah, it's already been used up. Uh, but the thing is like, no, I mean, it's it's like it, it there's like still out there. Um, it just like, it was actually kind of shocking. And then I was kind of like to what Peter's point was like, we spent so much time in Madripoor. Why didn't we see these? Right. I, I just wanted more, more of this. That, I was hoping like, for more of this. Like, you know, we saw a little bit of that in the first issues, right? When in Russia yeah. and all of yeah. that, but you know. It also called back to some specific older X-Men stories for me, or at least it evo- evoked them for me. 
um, the whole kind of taking apart the ships for parts reminded me a little bit of um, Warren Ellis's ghost boxes and where they chase the person that's uh, on the run there. And kind of this idea, as you said, that like everybody up the technology chain just dumps their technology down the chain to get broken apart without any thought of the environmental or human impact. And I thought that that was another story that's addressed that. And then also um, the other thing it made me think about is I happen in our household read to be up to Uncanny X-Men 235 through 238, which is the first time the X-Men go to Genosha. And like that the, they think they're being this awesome mutant team and solving stuff around the whole world. And here's this whole nation that's built itself on the idea of mutant labor that's just happening right beneath the world's eye. And until you go there, you don't know. And even in this like modern Krakoan age, it kind of made me reflect that this book um, derives a lot from that original Genosha plot, because it's this whole idea, like, if you don't go there, if you don't put feet on the ground, if you don't go and show them a mutant presence, they will continue to exploit us. And I think that that has a, a, a absolute, um, has an absolute analog in the real world for a lot of people who are exploited in the real, real world, whether they're ethnic minorities exploited in certain regions or women that are being exploited in certain regions. Um, it's kind of like, it all can look rosy from up outside and then you get there and the um, a lot of the scaffolding falls away from that pretty picture. And I think Genosha was the first time Claremont ever really told that story. And this felt very much a part of that line. Well, Tyler, what was yours that you want to dig into? You alluded a little bit to Bishop's reverence to Storm, but I didn't yeah. want to assume that that was necessarily your go. No, I mean, I wasn't really, I don't really have one like super favorite one. I just thought that there were some things which um, Dugan was doing here, which um, he, he, I did not think it the way that you did that, well, Dugan should have done it throughout the first 19 issues instead of just dumping everything here. Um, and now that you mention it, I kind of agree because <laughs> oh, no. I think that, no, because I think that um, the the main dissatisfaction with this issue, this book, this series so far is the Verandi kids. I really don't like them <laughs> and I really don't back. buy them. You know, you know what I mean? Like I don't buy that they are such a threat and that, is the big issue here. Um, I mean, why not just directly go into the Russian, um, you know, threat and, and, and do that over there or something like that? Or maybe- He's what is... Peter in your book. Peter Rasputin. <laughs> like, well, he's, you know, coming, he's... he's coming to this book, I think. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. I... <laughs> no, I'm just I... guessing. <laughs> um, well, I mean, the other thing also is that now we know that Callisto has the powers back because she was resurrected. That actually was my favorite one, the non-story from Callisto, yeah. because of because of the sequence of panels, and I think it's drawn brilliantly. Also, the colors. There's two colorists on this issue, I believe. Yes, uh, and they both do a marvelous job. The colorists are Edgar uh, Delgado and Chris Sotomayor, and I think mm -hmm. the colors in this issue are just absolutely beautiful, really, really well considered. Absolutely bring out all of the best elements of the artwork from uh, from Caselli here, and I, I just think they're brilliant. And the thing that I loved about that Callisto scene is that she says everything without saying anything. By showing that Storm was both the person who fought her in the Crucible and the person who reintroduced her to the mutant yeah. world really shows that Storm knows her the best. And all of the most formative moments in Callisto's life frequently come from Storm conflicting with her and saying, you've got to fight for this. I'm challenging you. And it's like, it really made me reflect that sometimes your best friends are the friends who will make you kind of put up or shut up. And they're the people who wind up knowing you the best. And through that challenge, that pushback, that like, you're not thinking about this the right way, you've got to go back and learn. That's what makes us grow into better people. And so Callista doesn't even need to say it. Storm knows it, everybody else knows it too. And there's like a little bit of a joke there about like, yeah, cause Storm's tried to kill her so many times. There's a little bit of like a, maybe a sexual innuendo there, who knows? Yeah. But to me, it really just made me think about like, you know who your real friends are cause they're the people who help you change. And this is Callisto saying in that way, you are actually my best friend. And which is why I think Dugan is such a great writer because he he basically filtered the relationship down to this really, really um, concise point. Like yeah. this is- yeah. He barely says anything, but you get it yeah. all. That's why, like, I, I understand your points that maybe this book got too lost in the woods with the Madripoor arc, but like he writes it so, like, these characters so warm with such a sense of camaraderie that like, that like even when it, maybe they're the, 
arc was a little long like i do i personally do buy that you can have this kind of like conversational thing where like just a lot of like warmth and happiness there like it it it's weird like emotionally it sells maybe more than the actual plot did i don't mm. know if that fully makes sense mm. but like it, yeah, does, it felt it right in the moment oh, it does. yeah yeah and the thing is like once again dugan does it so well it's like he calls yeah. back everything and Without. if i even yeah even if yeah. i don't know it doesn't matter it still lands how does I, he do that i don't want to be a jerk but if, if x-force did this issue like a a, a hangout <laughs> issue i wouldn't buy it for a minute but like dugan can write this like with that kind of like warmth not to keep using that word but like i, I just think of it yeah I think there's a lot of writers at Marvel in particular who are credited as these deep wells of continuity who know every issue and know every reference and they love to brag when they come onto oh, the X books how I know everything. I but do them. you know what? Having read Duggan on this, having read him especially in his Uncanny Avengers run, his Deadpool run, I would debate that Duggan pulls the stuff not only more effectively than other writers, but to Free's point, never makes you feel excluded. Like I did not yes. know a lot of Deadpool's history because I had not read a lot of Deadpool before 2013. <laughs> and like, I loved that book so much. And there were clearly nods to bits of old Deadpool and it didn't matter. And the fact that like, all of us got these points in this issue. Harry yeah. didn't know all those old Emma things. Faria has still not read all the old Callisto stuff with Storm. It doesn't really matter. It actually, on the emotional level, landed for all of us. And actually, the two of us who knew it the best up here were the ones who were like maybe a little bit more disappointed. Maybe and not. I think, <laughs> like, and I think there's different levels to it, right? There's this ultimate level, which is the like invites you in and makes you excited, even if you don't know about it. And to me, that's like the best comic making does that. There's the layer right under that where I think X Factor gets a lot of the time, which is makes the thing seem so cool that you feel like you better learn it so that you get the whole joke. Which is yeah. like, to me, just one level of nuance below the invite you in because you're still compelled and you still care but you still kind of feel like a little bit left out and then you go further down to the like well if you had encyclopedic knowledge of this particular plot <laughs> then the yeah. issue Check would out. be good I and then I you just get people who like are barely even cognizant of the of the yeah. past and characters. this is why i read shared con continuity comics it's like this is why i don't like alternate universes because I, I, I want this yeah, it's one thing to I mean, pull and, stuff out of your hat it's and also to actually you know, like emotionally the, make it connect. Go yeah, ahead, sir. correct. <laughs> and and also like Pyro just simply dropped the avalanche bit, which I was like, oh, <laughs> come on. <laughs> but see, that's what I'm saying. You said like you said, oh, and I went cool, cool. right? You know, I know. But then exactly. if, if Ewan did that, he would make me feel like a dumb person. <laughs> he, and if Leah Williams did that, I would also feel like a dumb person because uh. they will make it like, oh my God, wink, wink. You didn't read those books. I'm like, I don't give up. Like, you know, that's, I, I, did I pay for those books? No, I didn't. I paid for your <laughs> books. Thank like, you. Oh, we should read it in Thank a Mortal you. Hulk issue yeah. one time and see how that goes over. Uh, oh no, so, I like a Mortal Hulk, but, by the way. But... Because yeah, I read I like all the too. Hulk. Because I read every <laughs> Hulk before it. So so that brings us to this particular scene between Kitty or Kate. Well, before she became Kate, Kitty and Storm, mm -hmm. you know, right at the start of Marauders 1. It didn't quite work then. I don't think it worked now with this. And here's why. I did not really liked the fact that even though it was funny ultimately i did not like the fact that after kitty couldn't pass through the gate storm nightcrawler oh yeah <laughs> wolverine any of the other x-men that you know has a relationship with kate kitty pride at the time just abandoned her and went to krakoa and party like what because like life this, is tough. What, why? Why is the magic there to just teleport her to the to to the island? Like, why? Where is magic? Where is her best friend? And why did Wolverine just give her a, a grocery list? Oh, bring me these beers, and brandies, and whiskeys. I mean, that didn't work then. This fix did not work here either. So this is the part which I really just want to wipe off my memory. Regarding, with regards to Marauders. And for me, it comes down to like one specific dialogue balloon in this page. It could have still worked, it, but Duggan couldn't resist slipping in that, that thing about Emma and plastic surgery. It just needed Storm to say like, we're all needed on Krakoa, um, but some of us are gonna have to find our own way to get there. Like, I think if Storm had just acknowledged it and Kitty had been like, and she was right, 
I think that would have landed a lot better. And it's still the message of the scene. And I, I, it can be fine. I don't need to do a polished pass on Dugan's dialogue. He's a fantastic writer. But like, I think that's why it kind of landed with a little bit of a thud for me. Because I was like, much like you, I was like, here's this moment to actually like show us how Kate got set on that journey that brings yeah. us into Marauders 1. And I think he kind of flubbed it a little bit. Yeah. It's like a very inorganic way of making this character very isolated, even if it doesn't make any sense considering where who any of those characters around her are. I mean, are. it still didn't work for me. Like, it, yeah, it might have fixed a little bit more. Like, it, it makes maybe the interaction a little bit more... Um, the, it makes it a little bit more, more interaction between Storm and, and Kitty. But still, it doesn't fix the inherent problem for me. Mm. For, you know, to, to so set, set Kitty off this path so but isn't it because that you know to show that she's her own person and then she doesn't need to be handheld by these x-men again and again and again like you know because she was the youngest mutant among them and they pretty much raised her but i feel like that now it's like listen we're all doing our part okay this is now a different status quo we don't need to on, hold your hand on one hand time. that that makes perfect sense for marauders and it is establishing her as like the solo characters who's going to have a lot of growth on the other hand it is still kind of crazy they're like bet yeah. see on a boat later like it just exactly but 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 like emotionally it makes total sense for this book so it's kind of like what do you want to prioritize while you're reading and i you one, know, i can see both sides of that one day I'll figure out when people say that the original X-Men team, which is like the 96, X-Men 96 book, are actually kinder people because they are not as of right now. They are not. They just pretty much do their oh, own thing. but they thing were real then, heroes for you. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> I miss uh, the X-Men uh, just being heroes more often. Uh, <laughs> what voice is that? <laughs> it's, my, it's, my, it's my Chad 2.0 voice. Uh, my name is like, Chad. <laughs> oh, like, like comics from the new, 90s. New mutants are like that, though, <laughs> sure. by the way. New, if new mutants just left one of them on a boat, it's like, here's a boat, arrived there, I wouldn't buy it. <laughs> but when X-Men does, like the original X-Men, like, you know, those senior X-Men does it, I'm like, yeah, they, they are kind of like that. <laughs> they like, make it, make it show up here. They don't call each other when they're alive. They don't call each other when they're like, you know, have come back from dead. Like, it's like, well, they're just- There's no cell phone then. <laughs> all right, all right. No let's let's save it for Epic X Men reread. So I want to so I want to turn the opening discussion these final pages over to Harry for a specific reason, because we just okay. went to great lengths to talk about how Duggan invites you in even when you don't know the continuity. Ah, yeah. Tyler Free and I have read the specific story that this is referring to pretty recently. You have not. So what did yeah. you think about this heart to heart between Emma and Shaw on the uh, on the deck of the ship here and how Shaw seems to have a little bit of sentimentality that we have not seen elsewhere in this series. So I thought this was a great scene. And yes, I don't know the character he is referring to. I I'm pretty- Most people don't, their... by the way. It's no, real yeah, darn obscure. Like, okay. Yeah. <laughs> and that's why I just, I don't even engage that level. I'm just more like, clearly there is someone of import to Shaw who he is not over. Like I understand in the, in the meaning what's happening, which is because Duggan's a good writer, but like the art itself tells so much of these emotions and Shaw, Shaw in particular has a kind of nuance and like a wistfulness that I haven't really seen in this book yet. Yes. So I was just engaged. I mean, there's like this moment of like these two characters that have been plotting and they just stop and they're just, just thinking about some kind of like emotional tie and if they can figure that out. And it was like this very weird, interesting relationship between these two and like a cool hint of whatever's to come. I, you know, it's one of those things. It's just like, I don't know the background, but it worked for me really well. And, uh, I think Shaw looks incredible. He looks like an old sea captain. So T Tyler, as somebody who does know this background, even before we covered it recently, what do you think of this development that Shaw thinks it's time to bring Lourdes back? Yeah, I mean, I, I was shocked when, when the name came up and I would not have remembered that name had we not did our uh, reread recently, but I was like, oh yeah. <laughs> we should definitely bring her back. <laughs> and, and for some reason, when the name came up, I just kept, I mean, I just hear her voice in RuPaul's voice. For what? some reason, her name. I have no idea why. That is I'll, weird. I'll be like, Chantel. That's, that's the way I thought about it whenever the name comes up. 
Uh, I, I'm lost, even though the person who knows way too much about RuPaul in this panel. I will <laughs> I hand it over to Faria. No, I mean, it's like the character only showed up once, not even in a full issue, in a backup issue. And that one person Shaw probably ever cared about in his life. And because of that person's demise, he somehow decided to, like, you know, later on uh, invest in Sentinels. I don't know how his no, mind he, works. He, he basically took over the inner circle. Right. Yes, right. So it was like, you know, a whole thing, like it was Shaw's, you know. but then I think one thing that really kind of got to me is like these, like these two characters are going to forever going to be yin and yang, like, you know, they're always going to be, we're going to fight now, I'm going to take you down. And then no, we're going to be friends. No, then I'm going to take you down. It's like, they're never going to let each other go. And I feel like they have come to an agreement on that. And it's like, how about we do something that is beneficial to each other? And, you know, and if you look at covers, you're going to figure out what and I, I this love, conversation. And I love that it's like, yeah, like I poisoned you, but we both have interests and we're both can rise above that weirdly. And we'll just keep on scheming and plotting. And I'm like, I like that part. Well, I also yeah, think they're that there's an um, understanding. There's always a dominant and submissive aspect to Hellfire Club. I mean, it's, baked in to that they're based on on some real life kind of borderline sex clubs and uh or at least secret societies that have that eyes, eyes wide shut quality to them and the borderline it, well, I'm trying, <laughs> trying to be approximate here. and uh and you know we've seen throughout this we just recently on epic x-men we read, read a story where emma talks about the way she dresses in hellfire club and how she thinks she's no. using the power of sexism and it's kind of like can oh. you really <laughs> This is all kind of baked in and it's kind of like Emma's the one with her heel on his throat right now. And it's almost like Shaw is kind of um, enjoying the opportunity to not be in charge right now. He's like, while well, you've got your heel on my neck, I've had some time to think. And I really kind of like that. And I also just think that it is so clear that all of these ex-office writers sat down and read that classic X-Men omnibus, man. If you have not been following us on Epic X-Men Reread <laughs> and you have never well, read all the classic X-Men stories, I there are so many that have been referenced. There's at least 10, I think, that we have seen a specific reference to so far in this age of Krakow. Like the, they're largely Claremont and what's not Claremont is either Nocenti or Nicesa, almost with, to only one or two being outside of that group of three. And it is yeah. incredibly clear that this group of writers treats those stories with great reference because this is a deep ass cut y'all this is one backup story from 1987 <laughs> deep, deep as a cut as a cat and they are actually are going to reprint that backup story in full i think in next month's marauders and y'all better read it because it is an amazing story and it is going to change your thoughts on the origins of the health and, and the character that me. the character that they mentioned showed up only in that one issue yeah. and is drawn never by. to be seen <laughs> and <laughs> I mean, she's of course never to be seen, but and and she's drawn by. I, I mean, that 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 backup story is drawn by John Bolton. Beautiful art that that particular um, short story. Just and, so we're being absolutely clear, she does make a brief flashback reference appearance in a mini series of X Fire Hellfire Club issue number four, but otherwise she has not been seen since Classic X Men number seven. Just just so we're being totally. I don't think she talks totally in full. that. I, I don't think she talks in that. She just okay. show. She's just seen, she's not just there. not yeah. spoken. Because I, yeah, because I went and looked into that. Oh. Too. So the look, the final thing to say here though is not only do they want to bring Lotus back, but the crux of it is it was before Cerebro was online as a backup, also explaining Thunderbird not being around. Although technically everybody mm -hmm. supposedly got recaptured during Necrotia. So I don't know why this is even a thing that Shaw and, and Emma are saying, but Shaw says he's got a plan to bring to the hell, to the Quiet Council about that. And every time somebody wants to bring something to the Quiet Council, stuff goes down. So Freya, what did you think about this final comment from Shaw here? No, but Thunderbird's not coming back, not because of that. It's because of his relationship to death. He would actually kill himself right. if, he, if yes. he's brought back. But he also <laughs> technically was before Cerebro. And technically, the explanation we've been getting for that, at least editorially, I don't know if they've said it in the books, is that Necrotia kind of put everybody back in the board and, and they got all their backups. And also, I guess, Chaos War, too. Uh, oh, yeah. But anyway, so any thoughts? What is Shaw's plan that he wants to bring to the Quiet Council? Uh, I'm sure, but I, I hope that it's not about just taking another mutant nude and then just yelling at them and insulting them. I don't think it's that. It's probably something different. 
<laughs> but I'm here for it. I just want to see what mis- what kind of face Mystique makes when. <laughs> <laughs> oh, you get your dead girlfriend. Oh, I- you get your okay. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Like that's that's exactly why I want to see what Mystique thinks about all of this. You if know, some, like that's- I want. <laughs> One panel mystique just staring at Charles like across the room. <laughs> like that's all I yeah, want. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> like, I mean, that's what I'm saying. Like, people are trying, thinking of like within Hellions, we see someone wants to bring their daughter back, then new mutants. Uh Rain wants to bring her son back, and Mystique just sitting in the quiet council is like, okay, sure. So well, folks, that is all we have to talk about. Wait, for... before that. Oh no, Tyler uh, has just, final, no, just a small, final Tyler small mystique. thing. Yeah, because no, it's not a receipt this time. But um, I did mention before, like uh, I was wondering why Emma used the Sentinel head for the you know in the architecture of of, of of this um gala. I in this scene in this panel, I realized why, because the Sentinel head is, um, it's like spiking the enemy's head on a pike oh you didn't yeah, yeah. like uh this is our greatest enemy now we're above yeah. it so here's the, the proof like, like it's basically yeah. a warning that yeah kind of so thing. it's it's a flex well yeah. i also thought it was a you didn't get warning hold on. To like you just you just got you didn't get that in the x-men like giant x-men magneto no, that I was this all about no no i, I go know, back and I, read you no i knew that was a, a, a giant i mean the the head but I don't understand mm-hmm. why they chose that hat to be there. That's the thing that just, I don't understand. Yeah. Or well, maybe I'm just so vengeful. That's why I got it. I because, think it's a specific <laughs> reference to like, three this is key exactly... moments in Emma's life. I think it's meant to reference classic X-Men number seven because she views that as when the Hellfire Club almost like got away from some what it could have been. It references Uncanny X-Men 281 because Emma lost her students and she dies as a result of this Sentinel's attack. And it references uh, E for Extinction by Grant Marson because Emma once again dies and comes back refined as Diamond. Like it's, it's her crucible. The Sentinel is the thing that makes Emma's life change, just like Storm makes Callisto's life change. That's why it's not only there from like a story standpoint for Emma putting a head on a pike, but it's specifically referencing the three major inflection points in Emma Frost's history with the Hellfire Club and the X-Men. That's what and I mean. there better be one scene in the gala where like all the racists pass by it and they see it. <laughs> there better be. All right. Well, that, my friends, is it for our discussion of Marauders number 20. If you're looking for discussions of other X-Men books out this week, just look elsewhere on the channel. We talk about every X-Men book every week. And why, Faria, do we do that? X-Men is better when it's back together. That's right. And one of the most fun experiences we can have is to come with different opinions and then hash them out. Because as I always say, you get so much more from these issues when you have other people to share and discuss and debate and discover them with. So on the behalf of myself, Faria, Harry, and Tyler, I want to thank you for listening to This Week in X. And we will see you again next time. And until we do, we hope that you are well.